Hello, good morning, Yussi. How are you? Hi, I'm 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 well. Great, as well fantastic. as I can be in this situation, yeah. Yes, as well as one can be. That sounds good. Um, yeah, it's a complicated time, isn't it? And uh, so uh, on the other side, we have some new opportunities, and that is uh, we can do videos now, and uh, this is what we want to do today. So I like to first of all welcome you to our little kind of uh, interview here. And today, Jussi Heinonen will uh, talk to us about um, the Magma Chamber Simulator, which is a modeling software that Jussi has been involved uh, with and involved in developing. So, and today I have the pleasure to talk with you about that. And um, the Magma Chamber Simulator allows us to quantify petrological processes in magmatic systems, magma chambers and magma reservoirs from a geo um, chemical and a geodynamic or, or a thermodynamic standpoint. And Jussi is an Academy of Finland uh, research fellow uh, based at the University of Helsinki. And he received his MSc from the University of Helsinki in 2006 and his PhD in 2011. And uh, Jussi has uh, conducted some exciting fieldwork um, in Southern Africa, of course, in Scandinavia, but also in Antarctica. And um, he has recently become uh, one of the main player in developing this software package, Magma Chamber Simulator. And um, that is what uh, I'd like to interview you about today. Sounds good. Sounds good. So are you ready for some tough questions? Yes, I am. Okay, yes, I am. fantastic. Well, first of all, it's all good and well. Um, people have done have done petrology for a long time, and um, we um, kind of have some good records on the minerals and rock types and structures that are happening uh, around volcanoes and eroded volcanoes in particular. So, but. How do we really know and how can we quantify what, what, what actually happens in magma chambers? Could you say a few words about that before we go into the actual software? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question and, and, <laughs> and very important one as well. And, and I, there are many ways to do it, actually. Uh, I think, you know, if, if you would like to know what happens inside a magma chamber and, and see it functioning, that's, of course, impossible. You can't go there. They are deep in the crust and, and you would be burned alive. Uh, some uh, very uh, courageous geoscientists have taken samples from lava flows that are active lavas that are flowing and, and they look at those, but that's also a very dangerous job and it's, the sample is not anymore very pristine after you interact with it. So how do we then know what happens in these yeah. systems? Uh, one way, of course, the traditional way that you, you have done and I have done is that we go to the field and, and look at rocks that have formed by magmatic processes. Uh, the plutonic rocks, for example, the coarse grained gap rows and, and granites, they have formed deep in the crust in the magma chambers. They have kind of like stuff that has been left behind from the, from the magmas. And then when the magmas erupt to the surface, we can collect samples of solidified lava flows and, and so forth. And so we have all these rocks available here. And sometimes they already tell us quite a lot, you know, what was left behind, behind what was the first mineral that crystallized and how did the system evolve. But it's, it's not very well uh, usually thermodynamic. You can't constrain it thermodynamically very well. Yes, and, and that's it, often a real issue, yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, of course, one way to study them is as well that you take a sample and you go to an experimental laboratory with it and, and you crush it to a small powder and put it into a tiny like rice grain sized capsule it's a little bigger and usually, but uh, yeah, I know bigger. what you mean. It's a few millimeters. It, it's quite, few millimeters, it's quite yeah. small by comparison to a real volcanic system. That's right. So. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, the, the magnitude is the same. So, so I mean, magnitude is, is same to a rice grain, basically compared to. A large, I know. Yeah. Large yeah, yeah, I get your I get your analogy. Don't worry. So. Yeah. Yeah. So then you then you take it to a lab and subject it to a pressure and temperature that is present in a, in a magma chamber and so see what happens to it. What are the phases that are stable and how much melt there is present? Well, uh, imagine that you could do this in your, on, on your home computer, on your personal laptop, like crystallize a magma chamber. And that's actually what we are doing with, with MCS and that has been done with some other software as well is that because there's so much of that experimental data available. So we know a lot of different kind of compositions and conditions, what is going on in this, uh, in terms of phase equilibrium and thermodynamics in these systems. We can implement all that knowledge into a computational software that kind of like extrapolates and interpolates within that uh, 
within that uh, database and mines in information framework, yeah. in that yeah. framework. So we can just give a composition for magma and conditions like pressure, two kilobars, temperature, uh, 1200 degrees. And it tells us what is the probable phase equilibria, at, the most probable phase equilibria at that uh, at, in those uh, frame, at that framework, basically. This is very, very useful, of course. I mean, um, uh, experiments are exciting, but uh, it's also a lot of work and a lot of detailed work, and you need special equipment. If you can really fall back on the uh, combined um, knowledge that experiments have established on your PC at home, oh, that's quite uh, that's quite strong. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to more of this, Yussi. That's and, right. Um, now, but um, uh, this this sounds on first glance, if I talk to my mom, for example, this sounds on first glance a little kind of esoteric. I mean, she would wonder, why would we actually want to know about these <laughs> things in the first place? <laughs> Can you say a few words about that? <laughs> so. Of course, like like that's that's a very uh, common question and very common yeah, question indeed. related to other fields <laughs> of geoscientists scientists as well. That what, why are you interested in, in rocks? Why should we, or why should we study them? What is the benefit of it? Uh, well, one, one benefit of it is that, that volcanoes are, are responsible for some of the worst natural disasters in, in historic times and, and especially in prehistoric times, although humans were, were around at that time then. But, but I mean, uh, uh, petrological research and understanding what happens in mathematic systems, is, it's crucial to understanding how volcanoes work. And, and this has been used in, in several cases. One example, one good example is Mount St. Helens in, in Northwestern United States. Uh, by using these kind of research methods uh, and also others like, like seismic methods, there's quite a good picture of, of what led to the great eruption in 1980. That was a quite uh, bad local disaster. Mm -hmm. and, and now we have a pretty good un understanding what kind of precursors we should expect if, if that kind of eruption would happen again. So, and, and, and this, you know, this applies to everywhere. So understanding how magmas work is, is very crucial to understanding how volcanoes work and whether they are dangerous and, and so forth. Uh, this is very interesting that, uh, yeah. that you make that point. And um, I go even a step further because um, this is of course something from um, human history, i.e. Uh, I was, a, I was a, a small boy at that time, but I still remember it from being on television and things like that. But you also mentioned big events in earth history prior to humans settling the planet. And there's, of course, uh, these uh, rather kind of astonishing um, episodes like uh, uh, mass extinctions that uh, seem to um, be uh, simultaneous with large igneous provinces. When we think of the Permian mass extinction, one of the most devastating for life on the planet. And there was the Siberian large igneous province. And, That's right. Uh, this is very important uh, to understand because um, it seems that, uh, to my knowledge at least, that uh, the intrusion of the magma of the Siberian large igneous province into the continental crust with the various kind of rocks present there and the interaction of these things was uh, quite devastating in terms of um, large gas release and um, uh, the interaction is also something that the software package that you're working with is simulating. So I think this is uh, something beyond just our direct hazards that we are experiencing from volcanoes. This is actually something to understand evolution of our planet and uh, indirectly also life. So I think uh, it's quite important from that perspective as well. Exactly. I, I mean, the, the Siberian traps eruptions 250 million years ago, they they resulted in, in the biggest mass extinction of multicellular life, which is the great dying after which the dinosaurs, you know, evolved to be the, uh, if not the rulers, at least the largest beings. But they were quite dominant on continents. They were quite dominant on continents. They rose yeah. and uh, then, of course, yeah. they themselves got extinct in <laughs> another right. event. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. At 65 million yeah. years, but there was also maybe a little bit of extraterrestrial help, but uh, that's there was right. also a big. Um, large igneous province at the same time. And I just talked with uh, a friend from Stockholm yesterday. Um, he works on impact craters and he kind of argued that the combination of the magmatic processes, the Deccan traps at the time, plus the extraterrestrial kind of uh, help um, was um, uh, likely the reason for that. So uh, magmatic processes and the interaction of magma with their surrounding is very important, I think. And this is what you and uh, your colleagues are trying to quantify here and uh, make us uh, able to quantify. 
So that brings me on, if you don't mind, to uh, the next question on our little list, and that is, uh, what is the magma chamber simulator? What what is it actually, and uh, how does it really work? Can you give us a little bit more of an idea for those people not familiar with it? Well, it is actually this kind of piece of software that I that I talked previously in the introduction that that takes these thermodynamic and and geochemical uh, databases or or algorithms and, and tries to find solutions for these certain uh, magmatic environments. I mean, basically on, on your computer. And it's specifically designed for open magmatic systems. So it's not only, uh, you know, closed batch of melt that you crystallize into software, yeah, but that's it's the in, important aspect. Yeah, Indeed, exactly. Yeah. So this, this has been done before, like for example, melts, which is which has been developed by Mark Gearsoff and, and others. It's melts is actually the engine of, of MCS, but this engine runs uh, not only in this, in this magma batch, but also uh, tracks the thermodynamic and geomechanical consequences for the surroundings, like like wall rock that we call in the model. And and then there are, are also you, user can uh, you know uh, add recharge magmas into that magma chamber. So there's new magma flowing into the chamber. You can control all these kind of uh, uh, constraints of of open systems. So that is what is recorded in MCS. This. Uh, and, and it's it's very well uh, suited for uh, modeling this uh, interaction of that magma with its surroundings, like what we That's call That's what as I think is really important indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a, a real kind of uh, a strength, I think. And yeah. um, this is what I feel is increasingly becoming important. I think That's right. um, it's my feeling at least that um, up to about, well, 20 years ago, I think closed system processes was um, something most people were focused on. And over the last uh, decades, it became increasingly important to um, uh, and, and relevant and, and um, the knowledge became also bigger that um, we realized that the interaction with uh, the surrounding yes. magma and the crust is very important and the different crust rocks have different impacts and can cause different processes from making the rheology of the magma different to the explosive or the eruptive behavior of the magma changing to eventually also being able to release gases into the atmosphere and cause what we discussed earlier all sorts of kind of climatic and uh, um, um, yeah, problems for, for life on Earth. So uh, yeah. this is very important. Do you kind of mentioned previously you would be able to show us a little example? Yeah, I, I could show something probably to add, add what you said said previously uh, is, is that, you know, uh, of course, these interactions have been known for a long time already. Norman Bowen knew, like found that there is some kind of interaction happening between magma and wall rock in, in our early uh, 20th century. But, uh, but I mean, back then the models were just just putting magma and wall rock into a blender and just you know mixing them forcefully together and this is what you can get to get out from it and there is no constraints whether that is naturally possible or not so you know that's what we've been trying to do and I, I should mention you know that I just recently joined this team so there's a lot of work done by Wendy Borson and and Frank Spera from the United States in developing this already for for decades so I've been they I've been very been. fortunate to jump jump into this uh, team later on and and put my effort in building the uh, trace element isotopic engine for for MCS. So that's kind of like my role in this. I see. But anyway, okay. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, of course, I'm I'm ready to show you the model. Uh, something that is uh, very common for these kind of models that we use in research that the input and output is just uh, endless rows of numbers. Okay. <laughs> that, that that is not very. Uh, not very good to show like in this kind of interview people get, would get tired as as important as it is for our research as you well know so so but fortunately we have this kind of visualization tool for it that has that's been great i mean yeah. let me just add we've been uh, also chatting about a more practical session and uh, this may be something where you can show the rows of numbers but <laughs> yes. i think yeah for today maybe the visualizing <laughs> a visualizing tool is more, is more appropriate so yes, just yes. to kind of get better. people started and get a feel for yeah. what the power of the software actually is so from that point of view yes if you be so good then we'll start with that so. let's start yeah i will do the sharing. So, so here we are now in, in the visualization tool of MCS. Uh, we have melt. Uh, there's 50% of melt in the system and 50% of wall rock. And uh, melt has an initial temperature about 1000 degrees Celsius. And the initial temperature of the wall rock is, is 600 degrees. 
So now we just see what happens in this kind of situation. Of course, these two systems are not in equilibrium, but they will try to find the equilibrium uh, and, and you know that is governed by thermodynamics and phase equilibria of the system. So uh, the magma starts crystallizing. Uh, there are cumulates forming on the bottom. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's olivine and clinopyroxene that are the first stable phases. They are crystallizing in the magma chamber. Uh, the temperature of the magma drops and the wall rock gets heated because the latent heat of crystallization and sensible heat is, is transported to the wall rock. Okay, so more crystallization taking place. Uh, now uh, feldspar becomes a stable phase. And after that, we have recharge. So there's another pulse of magma coming in. Okay. And the system continues to crystallize. At this point, the wall rock has heated enough so that there's melt present in the wall rock so that it actually can uh, start being assimilated by the magma. So this is just governing or showing the phase equilibrium of the wall rock. So we have feldspar, quartz, uh, another feldspar. So this is potassium feldspar, then glacier place feldspar. There's some spinel and orthopyroxene by that and so forth. So now we are kind of like seeing what happens in, in the wall rock at, at the same time in terms of phase equilibrium after it has been heated enough for reactions to start uh, taking place there. So melt starts getting assimilated and you see there are phase changes happening in the magma. There's spinel, spinel becomes a stable phase in, in the crystallizing magma. And the amount of wall rock gets smaller because we are all the time extracting melt from the wall rock uh, to the magma. It's partially melting all the time. Finally, because there's a lot of SeO2 coming in the system, there's orthopyroxene crystallizing that becomes a stable phase. Uh, and then finally, there was another recharge and then we have fluid phase uh, separating from the magma and it's this small uh, blue dot here. Not much fluid in this system, but it's MCS treats fluid also as a separate phase. Oh, that's very useful. That's where the gas comes in that we discussed earlier. So, yes, but yes. in this particular case, yes, it doesn't seem to be too much gas, but uh, yeah. depending on the your specific situation, I guess there, there can be a lot of gas as well. That's right. And, and that's how it you know, functions. This, is, this was an example run, and this is where the wall rock and the magma reach equilibrium. There's still quite much, quite a lot of melt left that we can then continue to crystallize if we want to in the software. And all, all major elements and, and phase equilibrium and also trace elements isotopes can be recorded throughout this process in these different subsystems. Very good, very good. I mean, uh, this is really, really kind of comprehensive. Um, I mean, certainly much better than all the individual different software packages I have used in, in, in separation so far, uh, particularly if you can do the thermodynamics as well as the isotopes simultaneously. That, that's got a lot of strength and uh, is a real advantage for the future. Well, thank you for this. Um, would you be able to kind of uh, show us a more kind of applied example as well? Sure. Uh, like there are many, uh, I have applied this to many, many problems and, and people elsewhere already. But, but I think, you know, for example, uh, basalts eating basalts, like basalts, uh, basaltic magmas cannibalizing on, on basalts that have been previously erupted. That's one example. And also uh, dissolution of, of floor cumulates in, in large magma chambers, all these kind of processes that we are we have modeled and are modeling now, and I hope we are publishing them soon as well. A lot of interesting things. But the example that I want to show to you is the one that I published uh, in 2019, and it's in Antarctica. That okay. is one of my favorite <laughs> favorite study areas. Yes, you've and, been there. I said it yeah, earlier. I'm yeah. quite jealous, actually. So. <laughs> So, so this is the this is the environment there, and as you can see, the the rock exposures in places. Everybody always thinks that Antarctica is just you know it's just glacier and there's nothing else sticking out, but I mean there are these mountain uh, kind of like uh, valleys and and mountain tops nunataks that you can actually yes. see protruding through the ice, and and they are no vegetation in them, no no weathering almost, meaning I mean no chemical weathering, so the rocks are very well preserved. And, and this is an uh, example of this kind of uh, flood basalt exposure. So each, each uh, uh, pile that you see here is an individual lava flow that are kind of like stacked on top of each other. And they have been then eroded by this escarpment there. And there is the 
our expedition mechanic uh, is, is standing <laughs> on top of the tile, so you can tiny. see the I immense mean, not scale. As such, yeah. but you know, yes. I mean, yeah. the scale is incredible. So very it is, good. it is. And you know, understanding that these flows kind of like they they filled most of eastern Antarctica and southern Africa at the time when these erupted 180 million years ago, when Antarctica and Africa began to uh, be separated from yes. each other. So we are there in, in Westfela next to uh, Finnish research station. And, and when these magmas, uh, these lavas and their parental magmas, they came through the lithosphere, they saw all kinds of stuff there. So there's lithospheric mantle, there's Archean, very old, uh, different crustal sections, and also a little bit younger, but still, still very old Proterozoic uh, crust. So we are talking about billions of years of old uh, lithosphere composed of different kind of rocks. So they all, they saw all through all, all this when they came through from the mantle to the surface of the earth. So what happened to these magmas uh, along the way? Uh, there's one example of, of, of one magma type that we, that we modeled using MCS. So this uh, lava analysis are shown by these red dots uh, in these different geochemical diagrams that I'm not going to introduce you so that in, in more detail. But anyway, you see that they form these kind of trends in, in these or, or, or slightly uh, dispersed trends in these diagrams. And there are some uh, characteristics in them that are quite important. For example, in the most primitive rocks, uh, the most MGO rich rocks that are the most pristine mantle kind of uh, big critic rocks, we find orthopyroxene phenocrysts. Mm -hmm. And MCS tells us that, that orthopyroxene is, is not stable in low pressure. So they have to have uh, formed at, at relatively high pressure in several kilometers in the in the crust. So that's, I think, we can constrain the first uh, stage based on that. And, and we modeled a fractional crystallization, so only crystallization of the magma, and also assimilation fractional crystallization. Okay. So interaction with the wall rock at that pressure and formed these two uh, trend lines. And after that, we take these magmas uh, to lower pressures where there's extensive fractionation of plagioclase. That is a very common uh, phase in, this, uh, in these rocks. And when we take it to lower pressures in, in stage two uh, models, we actually see that the trend lines that they form are quite well, uh, uh, quite well, well uh, reproduced by the modeling, especially in terms of these major elements. But assimilation is then required to, to uh, cause this heterogeneity in isotopic and trace element compositions. Yes, I see, I see. Well, but uh, you get a lot of constraints there. This is really useful. And uh, I mean, we all had these problems with some crystals that we believe belong to some other earlier part of the system or even are external to the system, but you can actually constrain some of these things now. That's so, correct, yeah. This is what you kind of um, uh, read into the data then? Yes, that is that is the model then came, then came out, out from this. So, so we uh -huh. have... Uh, Fractionation and assimilation interaction with the wall rock happening somewhere in the depths of, let's say, 20 kilometers. And there we have olivine and orthopyroxene crystallizing. And then some of these early melts from here, they come to the surface of the earth. And those are the primitive big crystals that we find that contain these orthopyroxene phenocrysts. But then most of the magmas actually fractionated in these shallow magma chambers. And there was no assimilation, not at least that much assimilation taking place there because naturally the crust is a little bit cooler when we go to shallower, uh, so shallower uh, depths. So we need more energy to actually assimilate them. The magma the is cooler probably as well if it already crystallizes the cooler. depth. Yeah, exactly. That's that's correct. So that's that's controlled by uh, the like low pressure fractionation of the system. That's why how we get most of the basalt actually for this magma type. Very nice. So um, this is really useful to be able to constrain these things and uh, actually kind of point out where the assimilation happened, where the interaction with the crust happened. And of course, this helps when it comes to these big picture stories that we discussed earlier in the interview um, and, and saying things there. So very, very good. So um, can I uh, move on to my next question then? And sure. uh, we've touched on this to, uh, to some extent, and that is um, the advantages of um, um, the MCS, the Magma Chamber Simulator uh, package. But I also want to touch a little bit on uh, uh, the weaknesses. Could you quickly maybe summarize again uh, what the advantages are and maybe say a few words 
what the weaknesses are so that people get a good feel for what uh, can be done and what may still require some care and um, some consideration? Yeah, that's that's a very, very good question. And, and, and I think important in general. So, so uh, the, uh, I've talked about the advantages quite a lot already. So we, we have thermodynamic control for, for the magma and fall rock. So we don't, we are not only anymore just forcefully mixing things together, but we are actually trying to replicate uh, what happens in natural system based on thermodynamics and, and geochemistry. But, but I mean, that's, there's, there are also many other things that are happening in magmatic systems, like kinetic things, like crystals are moving and there are, you know, you see them everywhere as well, that, that you know, magmatic rocks are filled with disequilibrium textures and, yeah. and crystals that have been taken from other magmas and they are actually not equilibrated with the, with the magma. And MCS always models an equilibrium system. Yes, it always I tries see, to yeah. find the equilibrium. So, so that's one of the weaknesses. And, and, and of course, like taking, not, not taking account the kinetics and diffusion and stuff like that. So there are not this kind of, uh, let's say, other physical constraints for the system than outside of, of thermodynamics and, and mass. But, but I mean, uh, it's, it's still a huge leap forward. And, and I would like to see in the future that these kind of models that take account these factors would then be implemented in, in this kind of software. So then we would, yeah, then we would have, have more better constraints for dynamic systems. But yeah, even, even, even you know, if, if let's say you do an MCS model for the system that you're interested in and it doesn't work out, like you say, okay, this doesn't work out. I mean, that's also a result. And, and it is indeed it is, exactly it is. <laughs> and, and, and that tells you that okay maybe there is something else that is controlled that's this the system, point system so that, here that's your chemistry and thermodynamics yeah a negative result is a result and let me just um, point out from my perspective at least um i think a real strength here is that traditionally people have just um, assimilated bulk rock. And uh, I, I, I was never too happy with that uh, very early on in my career. I always realized the bulk assimilation models, uh, like uh, using just um, chemical AFC models or so, they often produced uh, unsatisfactory results in the sense that things didn't quite match. And um, so um, a few years back, I published a paper with a former PhD student about um, kind of changing degrees of melting from the country rock, um, yeah. partial melting being maybe the initial stage and then going to uh, bulk melting. And eventually you might even have restite melting and things like that. And that uh, this depends on the energy that uh, the magma brings. And uh, of course, the, um, the, the specifics of the country rock and things like that. And uh, this was very hard at the time to kind of model and I think um, the uh, magma chamber simulator is actually a huge advance towards understanding these processes that you actually don't have to do bulk modeling anymore that you can actually start thinking about a partial melt and the, the simulator does this for you and that um, you can kind of increase the degree of melt uh, or melting in the country rock and that this kind of will have an effect on isotopes. If you melt kind of hydrous minerals first, they will be potentially, if you have a very old country rock, they will be very radiogenic while uh, other minerals will be less radiogenic. And uh, people have speculated about this already in the late nineties, but to really quantify this in a system and model this, that that's kind of really a, a major step at the moment. So I think this is a huge kind of advance. And uh, as you say, even if it doesn't work, it tells you you have to think harder and think further. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> that is right. But I mean, exactly like you said, it's we, we've already shown with this with this model that it's like as in, in assimilating, let's say, partial melts of the crust, you, you only may need to need to input them like a you know little sprinkle of salt in the magma of these partial melts and they are so enriched in incompatible uh, elements and, and and radiogenic isotopes that the you know the magma composition in terms of those elements will change completely and you only need to add a little bit of them like in bulk case of bulk assimilation you would have to have a lot of wall rock coming into the system and then the masses would not make sense thermodynamically anymore Yes, no, this has been one of the big weaknesses with the bulk model that yeah. uh, actually there were, I don't want to be um, um, impolite, but they have been rather wrong, actually. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I mean, the science goes forward. 
is that they were not already wrong in the sense yeah, that this was yeah. what was uh, possible at the time but that's right i think the right. community realized with time that uh, they are not as complete as we like our results to be and yeah, uh, yeah. therefore in hindsight um, the results of i don't know 20 30 40 percent assimilation they might not be correct in the sense that nowadays we can calculate it better and many of these large assimilation rates uh, or degrees of assimilation may actually be explained with much uh, lower um, degrees of assimilation if you just have the right partial melt. And that is true. Um, this is, I guess, where we are moving towards. But, but, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think I must add that on the other hand, we, we, we've shown just with the software, we are hopefully publishing it this, this spring that in certain uh, uh, in certain situations, like if you have a really high magnesium comatitic magma, really hot, and they come into a lower crust that is preheated, they can assimilate almost their own weight of that crust. So, so there's, that's another, like we can go from other end to the other end, depending on what are the conditions and the geological environment that we are. Talking yes, about. this was my end, and that is that uh, <laughs> indeed, if the magma chamber simulator actually confirms large assimilation rates, then you have some confidence about that. That's and, right. Uh, That's this right. is, I guess, uh, exactly the point you just made. Yeah. yeah. So, and um, you can separate the kind of um, uh, less reliable cases from those where you can have some certainty. And when it comes to certain systems like large igneous provinces where you have huge magma flocks and um, uh, very hot mantle magmas potentially involved things would potentially assimilate quite a lot. And uh, then uh, um, this is something you can constrain as well and separate it from those cases where a whiff, a trickle of some uh, highly radiogenic uh, country rock, um, maybe a felsic country rock would have just added a lot of isotopes, but not a lot of volume. And um, this is of course kind of uh, uh, the strength of the system here. Now, I accept the limits, but I mean, as you <laughs> say, science moves forward. And uh, I think this was, um, one uh, uh, of the next questions indeed, and uh, I guess you partly kind of covered it already, and that is what your hopes are for the uh, magma chamber simulator and, um, and what way you think that it can impact petrologists and geochemists. So I, I'm gonna ask the question again, and maybe you can summarize a little bit what you said already, uh, because I think you, you basically addressed some of the key points um, previously, but um, so how do you feel? Um, how do you kind of, uh, what's your big hopes and how do you feel petrologists and geochemists can profit from it also in the long run? Well, I, I hope that the software, it's, it's now freely available so everyone can download it and I hope people will, will you know, start using it and, and get, get familiar with it. It's, it's of course one, one thing when you go into these kind of more complex models, then it's not anymore like that you just press a button and you get a result, but you have to have some kind of idea what you are do doing. So you have to do some work in order to constrain all the input and then be able to read the output. So you need a little bit, bit of, uh, 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 you know, work on that as well. But I hope like, like for the future, we could open this to some other programming languages that is, that is published now. It's, it's on Visual Basic, which is not the, not the most, uh, let's say, suitable software for many different platforms, for example, Mac and PC and so forth. So for example, programming this to Python or, or something mm -hmm. else would be something for the future. And then of course, trying to implement these kind of kinetic uh, factors and things like that. So I hope when you know we are doing modeling all the time, we are publishing results uh, soon with it. So, and, and have published so people can pick up, okay, this is what it can do. And I, wa I want to try it for my, own system and and you know we we as developers of it of course want to see people using it so that it works so if you if anyone there looking at this wants to use it if you have any problems or anything like that we are you know you can just contact us us and, and we are ready to help something that is very important that we are uh, the our main programmer guy brown is, is developing is the monte carlo option for the oh, mcs okay. so you know at this point, the software is so that you have to, uh, each, each model has to be run separately. But in the future, uh, this has already been tested and seems to be working very well, is that we would have a pu public uh, version that you can just, you know, run overnight, like 100 models with, you know, given constraints or ranges for some input values that you like to give. 
And then in the morning, when you drink your morning coffee, you can, the program has picked the best fit result for you. So you don't have to, you know, spend all that time. That's very attractive. I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> of course, still then you have to like look at whether this makes sense or not. So it's, again, it's not you a always black box, need but to I do mean, that. it makes, it makes them, yeah, it, it makes the, like, how do you, it doesn't require that much work from you anymore for doing the actual models. This sounds very good. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the more practical kind of aspects we discussed as well. Hopefully we can do something on this as well. Uh, but uh, no, I'm, I'm really positive about this. And I like to think this is a huge step forward to compare to uh, the days when I started to do um, very simple modeling and uh, found it very challenging. And nowadays, uh, many of these problems can be assessed and uh, quantified. And of course, there is never an end to this. There is always improvements possible. I appreciate that, what you say. But on the other side, I'd like to compliment you and your colleagues in uh, particular here uh, for, for actually putting this together. I think it's a huge accomplishment. It's a huge leap forward in terms of quantifying these processes in understanding how volcanic systems work and in predicting what will actually be the consequences of these processes, what's going to come out of volcanoes. And uh, here, a um, big compliment from my side for this work. I, I'm really impressed. Thank you, well, and, and thank you for the you know, interview. It's, it's been oh, great. my pleasure, it's my pleasure. As, as it always has been. <laughs> it's been great to talk with you. And this brings us already to the end. And um, uh, as I said, uh, we are hoping to uh, work a little bit more practically here as well. But um, uh, then maybe we'll have a part two. And um, well, you see, thank you very much for this. Uh, I think uh, people got a very good idea now. and. Um, um, students will also profit from this. I think my students certainly will like to kind of watch this several times. I will recommend it to them. And um, then um, hopefully a lot of people will use the software and uh, with time you can indeed improve it the way you like to see it developing. So thank you, Yussi, for your time and uh, for the explanations. I really appreciate that. And um, I say thank you and uh, all the best from my side. Thank you very much. And, and something to add, probably, if you want to see uh, MCS working, it's we are showcasing it in EGU 2021 this year. So that's the next opportunity to see how it works. That sounds great. I mean, yeah. that's very important that you say that. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Yossi. Thanks, well. Bye -bye. Thanks, well. See you again. Bye.